Chapter One of The Islands of Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. The Islands of Magic by Elsie Spicer Ells. Princess Blue Green of the Seven Cities. The Story of the Origin of the Azores. Once upon a time, in the lost kingdom of Atlantis, there ruled a king whose name was Grey White. He had married the beautiful queen Rose White. They lived in a magnificent palace, but it was a sad place because there were no little children in it. There are plenty of babies in the homes of the poor peasants who can scarcely find food for them, mourned King Grey White. Why is it that I, the ruler of this vast, rich kingdom can have no child to inherit my wealth and my domains. Women in tiny hovels have their arms full of rosy, dimpled darlings, sighed Queen Rosewhite. Why is it that I, the queen of this magnificent palace, can have no baby of my own? Queen Rosewhite passed her days and nights in weeping while King Grey White grew ugly and cruel to his subjects. Once he had been the kindest ruler in the world. Things went on like this for several years. Queen Rose White's lovely face grew pale and wan, and her beautiful eyes became so sad that it hurt the hearts of her faithful subjects. The king's face lost its expression of jolly kindness and became sour and cruel. They offered prayers and solemn vows before all the holy shrines in the whole kingdom of Atlantis, but no child was born into the royal palace. King Grey White grew so harsh and ugly to his subjects that the entire kingdom offered prayers and vows too. As things were, life was not worth living in the kingdom of Atlantis. In front of the royal palace, there was a beautiful terrace where King Grey White and Queen Rose White had loved to walk in the days before they had grown cross and sad. One night, when they were sitting upon the terrace enjoying the fresh, soft evening air and the bright starlight, there suddenly appeared a dazzling light which almost blinded them. Queen Rose White covered her face with her hands, and the king bowed his proud head upon his breast. "'Do not fear to look at me,' said a gentle voice. King Grey White and Queen Rose White glanced up. They saw a tiny fairy standing before them with a circle of bright light dancing about her. "'King and Queen of Atlantis,' said the gentle voice, "'you shall have a child, a little daughter, prettier than the sunlight. I have heard your prayers and vows, but I have also heard the prayers and vows of your poor subjects, too. The glad news had brought a happy light into Queen Rose White's beautiful eyes, but now it faded out and a look of fear crept in. It had hurt the Queen's loving heart to have her husband so cruel to his subjects. She often had told him that punishment would surely come upon him because of his harsh deeds. When the little princess is born, went on the fairy's voice. I shall take her away from you for twenty years. No harm will come to her. I shall hide her away from you and all the world within seven beautiful cities, which I shall construct in the loveliest part of your whole kingdom. Around these seven cities I shall place strong walls. At the end of twenty years, if your heart, King Grey White, is free from sin, and you have made proper restitution for all your wrongdoing, you shall receive the princess into your arms. Twenty years is a long time, said King Grey White sadly. Tears were running down Queen Rose White's cheeks, and she could not speak. You must wait until the twenty years are over, continued the fairy. If you attempt to enter the strong walls before that time, you shall fall dead, and your kingdom shall be consumed by fire. Swear to me now, in the presence of your faithful queen, 
that you will not try to enter these strong walls which I shall construct about the seven cities. I swear it, said the king, in a voice which trembled as he solemnly lifted his right hand. The vision disappeared as suddenly as it had come, and King Grey White and Queen Rose White sat alone in the bright starlight on the terrace before the royal palace. "'Have I been dreaming?' asked the king. "'It was not a dream,' replied the queen. Time passed, and a beautiful baby daughter was born to the king and queen of Atlantis. They gave her the name Princess Blue-Green. There was great rejoicing throughout the entire kingdom. Her birth was celebrated by lavish feasts and gay songs and dances. When the little Princess Blue-Green was only three days old, she disappeared from the royal palace. She had been carried away by the fairy to the seven cities which had been constructed to receive her. Years passed. Every day the king and queen received reports from the fairy. They heard that the little Princess Blue-Green was well, that each hour she grew lovelier. Sometimes there was almost joy in the palace when King Grey-White chuckled over the quaint sayings of the little princess which were repeated to him, and the queen heard with a tender smile of the tiny blue slippers and the green parasol which the fairy had given her. That day Queen Rose-White bought new slippers for many little maids in the city. As time went on, however, the royal palace of Atlantis grew almost as sad as it had been before the Princess Blue-Green had been born. Only to receive reports of their daughter was not enough to make the king and queen happy. They longed to see her with their own eyes and to clasp her in their arms. As the weeks and months and years rolled by without seeing his little princess, King Grey-White resumed his cruel treatment of his subjects. He was growing old, and his nature grew sour with the years. Queen Rose-White tried to reason with him. "'We must bear this thing with patience,' she told him. "'We brought it upon ourselves.' The king kept raging against the fairy, and did not notice Queen Rose-White's politeness in saying, "'We instead of you.' It was the king who was responsible for all the cruelty. Good Queen Rose-White had never had a cruel thought in her whole blameless life. At last the day of the eighteenth birthday of the Princess Blue-Green grew near. "'Are you sure that it is not eighteen years, which the fairy said, instead of twenty years?' asked King Grey-White querulously. Queen Rose-White assured him that it was twenty years, as he well knew. The king's anger broke out fiercely. "'I will no longer be kept from my daughter,' he cried. "'Would you break the vow which you solemnly made to the fairy in my presence?' asked Queen Rose-White, trembling. She had never dreamed that he would dare to break it. Now, however, she was thoroughly frightened at the thought which came to her. "'I'll break that foolish vow,' shouted the king savagely. Tears rolled down the cheeks of good Queen Rose-White. "'No good will come of this,' she mourned. "'Be prudent, dear king. It is only two years more which we have to wait.' "'The last two years will be the hardest ones of all,' raged King Grey-White. "'I cannot endure it.' That very day he started to prepare the army for the expedition to the Seven Cities, amid the queen's lamentations, and in spite of her fears and warnings. "'Be wise and patient, dear king. Give up this wild expedition,' were her last words to him, when, at length, all the preparations completed, he set out with his great army upon the dangerous quest of the seven cities, surrounded by their strong walls, in the loveliest part of the whole kingdom of Atlantis. King Grey-White marched on and on. 
It was a long and perilous journey, and the army suffered many hardships on the way. It seemed as if they would never arrive, but at last they drew near to what everybody knew to be the most beautiful part of the whole kingdom, where the fairy had taken the Princess Bluegreen to conceal her. Storms raged, lightning flashed, ominous roarings and rumblings sounded from the depths of the earth. Let us hasten back to the royal palace before it is too late, besought the generals of King Grey White's army. On, on, cried the king. Do you think I would abandon this expedition now? The words were hardly out of his mouth when a huge rock fell from its place near where he stood and rushed away down the mountainside. The earth trembled violently beneath their feet. Fearful rumblings and roarings sounded all about them. On! On! shouted the maddened king. Before them rose the great walls which the fairy had built around the seven cities. Within these walls was the princess blue-green, radiant with the beauty of her eighteen winters and summers passed in peace and happiness under the watchful care of the kind fairy. The thought of her thrilled the heart of King Greywhite. "'On! On!' he shouted to the generals about him. "'On! On!' they in turn passed the word along to the trembling soldiers which composed the royal army. With the fearful sounds and shakings about them, the poor men heartily wished they were safe at home. They rallied, however, for a final charge, and swept up to the walls which surrounded the seven cities. King Greywhite struck his royal sword against the great wall. At that moment the walls fell. The earth beneath their feet rose. Great flames swept up toward the sky and rushed over the land, sweeping everything before them. The sea raged over the earth in violence until it had covered the whole kingdom of Atlantis. The fairy's curse had been fulfilled. The king was dead. His kingdom was consumed by fire. When at last the waters grew calm again, all that remained of the great, rich kingdom of Atlantis was the group of nine rocky islands which today is called the Azores. In the largest of these islands, St. Michel, there is still an enchanted spot called Seven Cities. Great, wall-like mountains towered toward the sky. In the crater valley amid the wall-like mountains there is a lake of green and one of blue. The blue lake is where the beautiful Princess Blue-Green left her little blue slippers, they say, and the green lake is where she left her lovely green parasol. End of Princess Blue-Green of the Seven Cities To Two of the Islands of Magic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Luna The Islands of Magic by Elsie Spicer Eels The Islands of Flowers Another Story Over the Origin of the Islands Paradise is, of course, ruled by loving law. All places good to live in are governed by laws. Long, long ago, there was a little angel who broke one of the rules of paradise. Of course she had to be punished. Punishment always follows broken laws. She was banished from her heavenly home. Never again could she join in the chorus of celestial music. Never again could she look up into the face of the great king. Now it happened that this little angel loved the flowers of paradise especially. For the last time she walked through the heavenly gardens. "'Oh, my exquisite ones, I cannot bear to leave you,' she sobbed to her favorite blossoms. "'It breaks my heart.' The flowers lifted their fair faces to hers in loving sympathy. They breathed out their sweetest perfume at her gentle touch. They stretched out their hands to catch her trailing garments as she passed them. "'My best beloveds, you are asking me to take you with me,' cried the little angel. 
she filled her arms with the lovely blossoms of paradise. Now the angel was a very little angel, and the flowers she gathered made a very large armful indeed. She could not bear to leave any of her favorites behind. Slowly and sorrowfully she left the heavenly gardens. Slowly and sorrowfully she passed outside the celestial gate. When she had left the gates of paradise far behind, the lovely blossoms in her grasp were all that remained of heaven to her. They filled her arms so full that she could not hold them all. Some of them fell, down, down to the earth they floated. They came to rest on the smiling blue waters of the broad Atlantic. "'Oh, what shall I do? I have lost my exquisite ones,' sobbed the little angel. The flowers of paradise smiled up at her from the place where they had fallen. Never had they looked lovelier. "'My best beloveds are beautiful and happy,' she cried as she smiled through her tears. "'I still have all I can carry. I'll leave them where they are.' There are nine of the flowers of paradise which the angel dropped. They have always remained in the blue Atlantic where she left them. After many years Portuguese mariners found them and Portugal claimed them as her own. She named them the Azores. To this very day, however, one of the islands is called Flores, which means flowers. End of The Islands of Flowers Recording by Sandra Luna Chapter 3 of The Islands of Magic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. The Islands of Magic by Elsie Spicer Eels. Why Dogs Sniff? The Story of the Dog's Dinner Party. Once upon a time, the dogs gave a dinner party. All the dogs were invited, and all the dogs accepted the invitation. There were big dogs and little dogs and middle-sized dogs. There were black dogs and white dogs and brown dogs and gray dogs and yellow dogs and spotted dogs. There were dogs with long tails and dogs with short tails and dogs with no tails at all. There were dogs with little sharp pointed ears and dogs with big flat drooping ears. There were dogs with long slender noses and dogs with short fat turn-up noses. All these dogs came to the party. Now the dinner was a most elaborate affair. Everything had been arranged with the utmost care. All the good things to eat were spread out upon the rocks by the sea. A gay sparkling little brook brought water to drink. The sun was shining brightly, and a soft gentle little breeze was blowing. Everything seemed absolutely perfect. But there was a cross, fussy old dog who came to the party. She was a yellow dog, they say. Nothing ever suited her. Whenever she went to a party, she always found fault with something. Sometimes there was too little to eat, and sometimes there was too much. Sometimes the hot things were not hot enough, and sometimes the cold things were not cold enough. Sometimes the hot things were so hot they burned her mouth, and the cold things so cold that they gave her indigestion. There was always something wrong. At this party, however, there was not too much to eat, and there was not too little to eat. The hot things were all just hot enough, and the cold things were all just cold enough. Everything seemed to be exactly as it should be. "'How good everything tastes!' remarked the big black dog, between polite mouthfuls. "'Everything is seasoned exactly right!' added the black and white spotted dog between mouthfuls, which were entirely too large to be polite. That was an unfortunate remark. The cross, fussy yellow dog heard it. She noticed immediately that the big, juicy bone she was eating had not been seasoned with pepper. "'Will somebody please pass the pepper?' she asked. 
all the black dogs and white dogs and brown dogs and yellow dogs and gray dogs and spotted dogs fell over each other trying to find the pepper to pass there was not a single bit of pepper at that dinner party i can't eat a mouthful until i have some pepper whined the yellow dog i'll go into the city and get some pepper said one of the dogs nobody ever knew which dog it was the dog who went into the city to get the pepper never came back nobody ever knew what became of him whenever two dogs meet they always sniff at each other if one of them should happen to be the dog who went into the city to get the pepper he would surely smell of pepper end of why dogs sniff recording by pamela krantz of the islands of magic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dion gines the islands of magic by elsie spicer ells longstaff pine puller and rock heaver the story of three friends long ago there lived a blacksmith upon whose strong right arm there swelled great muscles and whose big hairy fist was capable of delivering so heavy a blow that all the men in the village and nearby countryside stood in awe of him he had a hot temper as well as a strong right arm and his pretty young wife grew so afraid of him that she ran away into the forest taking her baby son with her the blacksmith had become crosser and crosser of late because the baby sometimes cried at night and disturbed his rest in the deep forest the young wife found nuts and herbs and wild fruits to eat the baby boy thrived most marvelously soon he was big and strong able to kill wild beasts to add to their food at last his strength was so great that he could lift big rocks and pull up huge trees one day he said to his mother dearest one i'd like to leave you for a little while i want to go back to the village where i was born the stories you have told me about it keep ringing in my ears i must see the place for myself do you mind mother dear if i take this journey his mother had long foreseen that a day would come when he would no longer be content to live alone with her in the deep forest her heart ached but she gave her consent to the expedition when the lad reached the village he went straight to the shop of the blacksmith his mother had described it to him so often that he had no difficulty in finding it he knew at once that the man at the forge was his father he looked exactly as he had always imagined his father looked good day said he i'd like you to weld an iron bar for me a bar as tall as the tallest tree in front of your shop the blacksmith glanced at the lad and then at the tree you must have made a mistake in your measurements he replied you don't know what you are talking about the boy from the forest smiled quietly and stepped a trifle nearer to the blacksmith you are quite right he admitted thank you for pointing out to me my mistake i should have said that i want this iron bar made twice as tall as the tallest tree before your door i want it to be of good thickness too i plan to use it as my staff the blacksmith looked the lad over more carefully in truth he appeared as if he might be able to use the staff after all the blacksmith hastily agreed to make it at once and he didn't say a word about arranging the price in advance according to his custom have my staff ready for me next week commanded the boy as he bade the blacksmith good-bye when at last the lad was once more with his mother in the deep forest he told her all that had passed when i return for my staff i want you to go with me dear mother were his words when he had ended his story i cried the woman in alarm i'd be afraid to go from your description i am sure the blacksmith is in truth your father and i fear that his disposition has not improved with the years don't be afraid dear heart said the son i'll be there and i'll take care of you i'll see that he does you no harm they started out on their journey, and just a week from the day of the lad's first visit to the blacksmith shop, 
he stood once more in the door. He had left his mother hidden behind the bushes and shrubs. Good day, he said to the blacksmith. Is my staff ready? Yes, indeed, it is entirely completed, replied the blacksmith more politely than he was in the habit of speaking, even to the parish priest himself. I have just sent for two yokes of oxen and enough men to drag it out of my shop. That is quite unnecessary, responded the boy. I'm sorry indeed to hear that you have inconvenienced yourself. He picked up the staff and tossed it about as jauntily as if it had been a slender cane. The blacksmith stared at him in amazement, his mouth wide open and his eyes bulging out of his head. May I ask who you are? he asked as soon as he could catch his breath. "'My name from this day forth shall be Longstaff,' replied the lad, "'and it so happens that I am your own son.' The blacksmith listened in surprise while the boy told the story of the years he and his mother had lived in the deep forest. He embraced his son tenderly. "'You are indeed a son to be proud of,' he cried. "'Come and live with me. We shall have a happy life together.' The blacksmith was thinking that a strong young man like this would be a great help around the shop. Longstaff shook his head. "'Thank you, but I cannot tarry here,' he said. "'I must go away and see the world a bit. My mother, however, is waiting behind the bushes. I fear she will be very lonely while I am away.' When Longstaff's mother came in response to his call, her husband embraced her lovingly and kissed her. "'I've really missed you about the house while you have been away,' he told her. "'If you are not good to her, you'll hear from me,' said his son, as he looked him straight in the eye. Longstaff then set out to see the world, traveling from one country to another. After a time he came to a place where there was a man pulling up pine trees by the roots, as easily as if they were the weeds in your garden. "'Good day,' said Longstaff. "'What is your name?' "'I am called Pine Puller,' was the reply. "'I'm very strong, as you can see for yourself. But I've heard that there is somebody stronger than I am. His name is Longstaff, I am told.' Longstaff gave his iron staff a gay toss into the air and caught it again in his hand. That happens to be my name, he said. I like you. Won't you join me in my travels about the country? We two would have a jolly time together. Pine Puller accepted the invitation, and together they journeyed on. Soon they came to a place where there was a man picking up great rocks and tossing them about as lightly as if they had been rubber balls. Good day, said Longstaff. What is your name? My name is Rockheaver, replied the other. You can see for yourself that I am very strong. I've heard, however, that there is somebody stronger than I am. His name is Longstaff, I am told. That happens to be my name, said Longstaff, and this is my friend Pine Puller. You are just the man to complete our little party. Won't you join us as we travel about the country? Rockheaver accepted the invitation with glee, and the three friends journeyed on together from that hour. Everywhere they went, they had everything their own way because of their great strength. One day, Longstaff, Pine Puller, and Rockheaver sat on a rock by the sea. Suddenly they spied two pretty girls tossing glass balls back and forth and catching them. They had not stood there on the sand a moment before when the three friends had passed that way. Possibly they had been bathing and had only just come out of the water. Longstaff ran to speak to them. He put out his hand and caught their two glass balls at once. Then a strange thing happened. The two beautiful maidens disappeared the very minute Longstaff put their two glass balls into his pocket, and he was left standing alone on the sand by the sea. That is queer, he complained, as he told Pine Puller and Rock Heaver what had happened. Not far away there was a little house. There were no signs of life about the place, and consequently the three friends entered. Inside the house there were beds, beautiful furniture, and a kitchen completely furnished with pots and pans. "'I like this house,' said Longstaff, as he seated himself in the largest chair. "'I'm going to rest a bit, and you two can go hunting. When you return, I'll have the dinner cooked for you.' Accordingly, Pine Puller and Rock Heaver went away to hunt for game. Longstaff rested for a while in the big chair, and then he went into the kitchen to light the fire. Soon the fire was burning merrily, and the water in the kettle was bubbling away cozily. 
longstaff cooked the dinner exactly as his mother had taught him long ago in the deep forest just for a minute he turned his back to hunt for the salt when he turned around the pots and the frying pan were gone from the fire there was a tiny dwarf with red boots disappearing through the kitchen floor with longstaff's good dinner longstaff gasped he was not at all accustomed to having his dinner stolen from under his very nose as it were soon pine puller and rock heaver came back with the hares they had killed in the hunt they looked at the dying fire at the empty pots and frying pan and at the dazed expression on longstaff's face where's the dinner asked pine puller i'm as hungry as a bear you said you'd have it ready when we got back i know what he's done cried rock heaver he has eaten all the dinner and hasn't left a single mouthful for us when longstaff told them the story of the dwarf with red boots who had stolen the dinner it was difficult to make them believe it very well said he if you won't take my word for it why doesn't pine puller stay in the kitchen and cook these hares rock heaver and i will go away and you can see what happens accordingly longstaff and rock heaver went away and pine puller made a stew of the hares while he was hunting for the salt the little dwarf with red boots came out from under the table and stole the stew pine puller turned around just in time to catch him at it he raised his big arm to seize him but the dwarf in the twinkling of an eye vanished into the floor taking the stew with him when longstaff and rock heaver returned pine puller told what had happened i believe you now said he to longstaff i ask your pardon for doubting your word however rock heaver was not convinced i know what has happened said he you were so hungry you couldn't wait for us and you ate up the stew you and longstaff have plotted that i shall go with an empty stomach this day let rock heaver then be the one to stay in the kitchen suggested longstaff we have brought back other hares from the hunt let him cook them and see what happens longstaff and pine puller went away leaving rock heaver to cook the hares again the dwarf with red boots jumped out from under the table and stole the dinner when his two friends returned rock heaver begged their pardon for his moments of distrust these are surely queer doings said longstaff i'm going to make an investigation i'll not rest in peace until i find out where this red-booted dwarf lives and where these three dinners have gone come and help me dig up the ground under the kitchen at once rock heaver dug up the floor of the kitchen and pine puller pulled out the earth beneath soon they had a deep well-like hole reaching down into the ground while they had been digging longstaff had made a ladder out of the branches of the trees a ladder so long that it could reach very far into the earth i'm going to be the one to descend into this hole remarked longstaff when he thought that it was quite deep enough indeed his two friends were entirely willing that he should he lowered the ladder he had made and very cautiously he crept down into the earth at the foot of the ladder he came to what looked like a heavy barred door he had brought his big iron staff with him of course and with this he knocked hard at the door who is there called out a voice from within i am longstaff open go away as fast as you can said the voice this is the home of the seven-headed serpent if he catches you it will be serious you will be enchanted and can never get away i'd like to meet this serpent for a minute or two said longstaff the heavy door swung open and longstaff stepped inside immediately he heard a rushing like a great wind with his big iron staff he struck a mighty blow at the seven-headed serpent he hit him just in time to avoid being enchanted the huge seven-headed serpent fell to the ground completely stunned by longstaff's blow at the first drop of blood which fell from the wounded monster a beautiful maiden appeared near the door longstaff recognized her at once as one of the two girls he had seen on the seashore tossing and catching the two glass balls he took the balls out of his pocket do you recognize these he asked the maiden indeed i do she replied one of these glass balls belongs to me and the other belongs to my sister she too has been enchanted and it is behind the next door you see ahead of you i'll get you away from this evil place said longstaff and then i'll see what i can do to help your sister he lifted her in his arms and started to carry her up the ladder wait just a minute she said 
I think I'd better give you back this glass ball. I'll not be able to speak a word while you have it, but I think you need it more than I. She gave him back the glass ball, and then they hastened up the long ladder. When Pinepuller and Rockheaver saw the lovely maiden in Longstaff's arms, they were filled with amazement. She is a princess who has been enchanted, explained Longstaff. Take good care of her while I return for her sister. Then we will restore these fair damsels to their father, the king, who has long mourned them as dead. Once more Longstaff crept down the ladder and into the depths of the earth. The seven-headed serpent was still lying where he had fallen, and Longstaff stepped past him and knocked at the door which barred his way. Who is there? called out a voice from within. This is Longstaff. Open. Hurry away as fast as you can. This is the home of the dwarf with red boots, said the voice. That red-booted dwarf is exactly the person I want to see, answered Longstaff, holding fast to his heavy iron bar which his father had made him long ago in the blacksmith's shop. The door slowly swung open, and Longstaff stepped inside. At once he heard the footsteps of the red-booted dwarf. The tiny dwarf looked up at him in surprise. "'We'll fight and see who is the best man,' stormed he. "'You fight with the black sword, and I'll use the white one.' "'No, indeed,' said Longstaff. "'I'll use the white sword, and you the black. "'Otherwise I'll not wait to fight with swords, "'but will choose my own weapon, "'which happens to be this iron staff of mine.' The little red-booted dwarf looked up at the heavy iron staff in Longstaff's hand. It could crush him very easily indeed. Very well, said he, just as you like. Longstaff fought with the white sword and the dwarf with the black one, and soon the dwarf had fallen, though his great agility made up for his lack of size. With the first drop of blood which fell from the red-booted dwarf, the beautiful princess was disenchanted. She gave her glass ball back to Longstaff, after she had recognized it as her own, and, safe in his arms, she was borne up the long ladder to the place where her sister was waiting her with Pinepuller and Rockheaver. "'I've left my staff behind!' cried Longstaff in alarm. "'I must go down once more and get it.' He had never been without his staff near at hand, even when he was asleep. Hastily he again descended the ladder. There was his staff lying where he had dropped it when he took the white sword. When he turned around to go up the ladder again, it had disappeared. His friends had forgotten all about him, so interested had they become in the two beautiful maidens. Even at the moment they were on their way to the king's palace, they had pulled up the ladder, never giving another thought as to how Longstaff was going to get out of the hole. Longstaff shouted in vain. Then he remembered how the dwarf had appeared in the kitchen. Evidently the red-booted dwarf knew how to get up to the surface of the earth. A drink from Longstaff's flask quickly revived him. He reached for the white sword, ready to fight again. "'Wait a minute, my friend,' said Longstaff. "'You are now my prisoner. I'll let you go as soon as you perform a little service for me. Just take me up to the surface of the earth.' "'That is easy,' answered the dwarf. "'Take hold of my hand.' As soon as Longstaff had taken the hand of the red-booted dwarf, he felt himself rise. In a moment he was safe outside the hole. "'There's another thing I want you to do for me before I let you go,' he said. "'Take me to the king's palace.' Longstaff took hold of the dwarf's hand, and in a moment more they were at the palace. It was only a minute after the king's daughters had been restored to him. The royal palace was wild with joy. Even the fact that the two lovely maidens were dumb was almost overlooked. When Pinepuller and Rockheaver saw Longstaff's angry eyes, they ran away as fast as they could. They were never seen near the royal palace again. Longstaff drew the two glass balls from his pocket and gave one to each of the two beautiful princesses. At once they could speak, and together they told their story to their father, the king. You may wed whichever princess you prefer, said the king to Longstaff, when he had heard how he had made the bold rescue. Longstaff wedded the princess who was more beautiful than her sister, and when the king died he reigned over the whole kingdom. End of Longstaff, Pinepuller, and Rockheaver, The Story of Three Friends Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah Five of the Islands of Magic. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Islands of Magic by Elsie Spicer Eels. The Table, the Sifter, and the Pinchers. The Story of the King's Laborer and His Wages. Once upon a time there was a man who was very poor. He had so many children, it was difficult to earn enough money to provide for them all. Accordingly, he left home and hired out to the king of a distant land. At the end of a year's time, he went to the king and said, I have served you faithfully for a whole year. Now I wish to return to my wife and children. Pay me, I pray you, what you owe me for my work. The king said, I will not reward you in money. I will give you something better than money. Here is a table. When you are hungry, all you have to do is say, Table, set yourself. Then the table will immediately be spread with food. Thank you, good king, replied the man. With this table it will be easy enough to provide food even for all my large family. When the man had started home with his table, he soon grew very hungry. He put it down by the roadside under a leafy tree and said, table set yourself immediately it was full of the most delicious food the man ate all he could and gave the rest away to some beggars who passed that way it is a lucky day for us said the beggars as they thanked him that night the man stopped at an inn he was so delighted with the magic powers of his table that he foolishly told the innkeeper about it that would be a most excellent table for me to possess thought the innkeeper with this in my possession, I would soon be a rich man. I could charge my guests a price in proportion to the rich food I would serve them, and I'd never have to spend a cent of my money to buy supplies. That night, the innkeeper stole the table and substituted another for it, which looked exactly like it. Early in the morning, the man loaded the table on his back and hurried home to his wife and children. We'll never be hungry again, he cried as he embraced his wife. Never again shall our children call for food when we have nothing to give them. How much did the king pay you? asked his wife in surprise. The good woman well knew how much it cost to buy food enough to keep all their children from going hungry. The king did not pay me in money. He gave me something better than money, replied the man. Do you see this table? Call the children. I want to show you something. The man's wife and children all gathered about the table, watching it curiously. Table, set yourself, said the man. The table remained standing in the centre of the floor, just as it was. What trick is this? asked the good wife. She had been a bit suspicious from the moment she had heard that there was no money in her husband's pockets. I'll get the beggars I fed to prove to you what this table provided yesterday, he said, when he had told all the story. You'd better go back to the king as fast as you can, advised the wife. Take back this good-for-nothing table which he has imposed upon you, and ask for some real money instead. The man did as his wife advised. The king was thoughtful for a moment. He guessed that the man had been robbed. At last he said, I'll give you a sifter this time. When you need money, all you have to do is to say, Sifter, sift. It will sift out money as freely as if it were flour. The man was delighted with the sifter. He sifted his pockets full of money immediately and hurried home. On the way, he again spent the night at the inn. When I brought my table home, it wouldn't work, he told the innkeeper. I took it back and got something in its place, which is all right. The innkeeper watched him sift out money. Why don't I get that sifter, thought the innkeeper. I work very hard serving my guests, even though the table provides the food for them. If I had this sifter, I wouldn't have to work. I'd close the inn and pass the rest of my life enjoying the money I'd sift into my pockets so easily. That night, he stole the sifter and substituted another, which looked exactly like it. When the man reached home, there was plenty of money in his pocket, and his wife and children were happy for a little while. However, he soon wanted to display the magic gifts of his new sifter. Accordingly, he called his family together, Sifter, sift, he commanded. The sifter behaved just like any ordinary sifter. You have been tricked again, cried his wife. 
She was very cross indeed, and told her husband exactly what she thought of him. Home was not a comfortable place for him that day, so he decided to hurry back to the king after he had emptied all the money in his pockets into his wife's lap. This will supply you for a while, he said. It is quite as much as any ordinary husband would have brought home for a year's work. A woman hates to have her husband made a fool of, replied the woman as she rolled up the money and tucked it away carefully. When the king had heard the story, he was entirely convinced that the man had an enemy who had stolen both the table and the sifter. Where did you spend the night? he asked. The man told of passing the night at the inn. I've heard that innkeeper is going to retire from business. He has become rich, said the king. You'd better hurry there as fast as you can before he leaves town. The laborer nodded his head thoughtfully, a wise look creeping into his eyes. Take these pinchers, ordered the king. Use them on that innkeeper until he gives back the table and the sifter. When the innkeeper was sore and black and blue from the pinchers, he gave back the table and the sifter. After that, there were prosperous days ahead for the king's laborer. Whenever the children were hungry, he would say, Table, set yourself, and immediately the table would be full of the most delicious food. Whenever his wife said, I need some money, he would call out, Sifter, sift, and the sifter would sift out money as freely and easily as if it were flour. As for the pinchers, they proved to be quite as useful as the other gifts he received from the king. Whenever the children were naughty, he only had to glance in the direction of those pinchers. The children would immediately behave as they should. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of the Islands of Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Luna. The Islands of Magic by Elsie Spicer Eels. Linda Branca and Her Mask. The Story of the Girl Who Did Not Like to Be Pretty. Long ago, there lived a girl who was so pretty she grew tired of being beautiful and longed to be ugly she was so attractive that all the young men in the whole city wanted to marry her every night the street in front of her house was full of youth who came to sing beneath her balcony linda branca that was the girl's name grew tired of being kept awake nights it is well enough for a little while to hear songs about one's pearly teeth and snowy arms, one's flashing eyes and waving hair, one's rosebud mouth and fairy-like feet, but a steady diet of it becomes decidedly wearing. I wish I were as homely as that girl who is passing by, she remarked one day. Then I could sleep nights. If I were as ugly-looking as that, I'd have a chance to select a really good husband, perhaps. With so many to choose from, it is terribly confusing. I'll never be able to make any choice at all, as things are now. I'm afraid I'll die unwedded, she added, as she carefully surveyed the girl's coarse hair, her large feet and hands, her ugly big mouth and ears and small red-lidded eyes. That girl has a much better chance of successful marriage than I have with all this tiresome crowd of suitors to drive me distracted. The girl in the street heard her words and looked up. When she saw how lovely Linda Branca was, she was amazed, indeed, at the words she had heard. She thought that she must have made a mistake, and asked Linda Branca to say it all over again. "'You can be exactly as homely as I am,' declared the girl, when at last she had sufficiently recovered from her surprise to find her tongue. I am an artist. I can prepare a mask for you which will make you just as ugly as I am. Go on and make it as soon as you can, cried Linda Branca, clapping her little hands in joy. That evening the suitors in the street under the balcony thought that the lovely Linda Branca had become very gracious. She was frequently to be seen on the balcony looking eagerly up and down the street as if she were expecting someone. 
Her dark eyes were sparkling, and her fair cheek had a rosy flush upon it, which they had never seen before. "'The beautiful Linda Branca is more charming than ever,' was the burden of their songs that night. Linda Branca was so excited about her new mask that she could not have slept even if there had been no suitors to disturb her with their songs. When at last she fell asleep towards morning, it was only to dream that the new mask had the face of a donkey. It was not until the next week that the mask finally arrived. Linda Branca had grown very impatient, and was almost in despair lest she should never receive it. When at last the girl brought it, one could easily see why it had taken a whole week to prepare it. So like a human face it was, that it was plain that the making of it had called forth great patience and skill, as well as necessary time. "'It is even uglier than I had hoped it would be,' cried Linda Branca in delight when she saw it. Surely, when she tried it on, no one of her suitors would ever have recognized the fair Linda Branca of their songs. Now, Linda Branca had no mother, and her father was away on business, so it was an easy matter to prepare for her departure. Linda Branca's father was a man of wealth, who spared no money in giving his daughter beautiful gowns to enhance her rare beauty. She had one dress of blue trimmed with silver and another of blue embroidered with gold. As she packed up a few belongings to take with her, she decided to add these two favorite garments. Who knows, but I may need them some time, she mused as she rolled them up carefully. With the ugly mask upon her face and dressed in a long dark cloak, she quietly stole out of the house. She went to the king's palace in a neighboring city and inquired if there were in need of a maid. Ask my son. It is he who rules here, said the king's mother. The king looked at Linda Branca with a critical eye. I hired my last servant because she was so pretty, he remarked. I think I'll hire this one because she is so ugly. Accordingly, Linda Branca became a servant in the royal palace. She soon discovered, however, that it was the pretty maid who received all the favors. It was good to sleep nights without being disturbed by the song of suitors under her window. Nevertheless, after a time, Linda Branca could not fail to see that it was the pretty maid who had the happy life. "'I believe I'd almost be willing to be pretty again,' said Linda Branca to herself. "'Perhaps it has some advantages.' She knew very well that the pretty maid was not as tired as she was that night. The next day there was to be a great feast, which was to last for two days. Linda Branca asked the queen if she might be allowed to attend. "'Ask my son,' said the queen. "'It is he who rules here.' "'May I go to the feast?' asked Linda Branca, when she was blacking the king's boots. "'Look out, or I'll throw my boot at you,' said the king. That night, when the feast had already began, she dressed herself carefully in the robe of blue trimmed with silver. It was indeed a pleasure to remove the ugly mask, and find that she was still just as lovely as when the crowds of suitors sang about her great beauty. That night at the feast everyone talked about the beauty of the mysterious stranger in the dress of blue trimmed with silver. The king himself danced with her. He was completely captivated by her charm. "'Where do you come from, lovely lady?' he asked. "'I come from the land of the boot,' replied Linda Branca with a gay laugh. The king was completely mystified, for he did not know where the land of the boot was. He asked the queen and all the wise men of the court, but there was not a single one of them who had ever heard of that country. The next day they hunted through all the books and all the maps, but there was no book or map which mentioned it. "'She's the most beautiful maiden I've ever seen,' cried the king. "'I'd like to marry her, but how can I ever see her again if I can't find out the location of the land she comes from?' He was in deep despair and every one in the royal palace was nearly distracted. It was decidedly embarrassing to have the king fall in love with a stranger from a country nobody could find on a map or in a book. When the king returned from the feast, he saw the ugly little maid he had hired busy at her work about the palace. 
the next day she again asked the queen's permission to go to the feast that night ask my son was the queen's reply when linda branca asked the king's permission he replied look out or i'll hit you with my hairbrush that night linda branca again removed her ugly mask and dressed herself in the beautiful gown of blue embroidered with gold she was even lovelier than the night before when she entered the grand ballroom the king was almost wild with joy he ran to her side at once and kept dancing with her the entire evening what country do you come from he asked again i'm from the land of the hairbrush replied linda branca where is that land asked the king but linda branca would not tell him where is the land of the hairbrush asked the king of the queen mother and of all the wise men of the court nobody could tell him and nobody could find the land of the hairbrush upon any map or any book stupid ones cried the king i don't believe you have half tried to find it he looked through all the maps and books himself and at last he grew ill from so much studying. His friends all gathered about him in the royal bedchamber and sought to console him. However, he refused consolation. "'I do not care whether I live or die,' he cried. "'I care for nothing except the beautiful stranger who came to my feast.' Linda Branca knew that the king was ill, and when these words were reported to her, she quickly dressed herself in the robe of blue trimmed with silver which she had worn the first night of the feast. When she took off her ugly mask and looked at herself in the glass, she was really pleased with her reflection. It is not so bad, after all, to be pretty, she said as she smiled. Linda Branca stole out of the palace and peeped into the window of the royal bedchamber. One of the king's counsellors saw her. Whose lovely face is that at the window? he asked. It is surely the beautiful stranger from the land of the boot said one it is the charming maiden from the land of the hairbrush disputed another by the time the king himself had reached the window there was no one to be seen he called for the queen his mother tell me mother who was outside my window a moment ago he asked no one unless a masquerader replied the queen the poor queen was nearly worn out with worry over her son. She was afraid he was so sick that he was going to die. The next day the king had, in truth, grown most decidedly worse. The court physicians went about with anxious faces, and the whole palace had become a place of deepest gloom. Linda Branca put on her dress of blue embroidered with gold, and again peeped into the window of the royal bedchamber. Now the king had laid upon his richly carved bed with his eyes fixed every moment upon the window whence the face had appeared he did not close his eyes at all he can't live long if this keeps up one court physician whispered to another he had just finished saying these words when the king gave a loud cry and sprang from his bed he ran to the window and reached it just in time to catch a piece of the skirt of blue embroidered in gold he held it tight masquerader unmask he cried Linda Branca had hastily put on the mask which she had brought with her, and now she looked up at the king with the face of the little servant he had hired. She took off the mask and smiled into his eyes. Now at last I know who is the beautiful stranger from the land of the boot and the land of the hairbrush, cried the king. When Linda Branca had told the king, the queen mother, and all the courtiers her whole story, everybody laughed. Whoever before heard of a maiden who wanted to be less beautiful than nature had made her, cried the wise men. I always knew that when my son saw fit to select his bride, he would choose a rare woman, said the queen mother proudly. The king himself did not say a single word, but gazed and gazed at the lovely face of Linda Branca with such joy in his eyes that she knew in her heart that at last she was glad to be beautiful. Stay pretty is a parting greeting between women in the Azores. Perhaps it was Linda Branca herself who began saying it in the beginning. End of Linda Branca and Her Mask
Chapter Seven of The Islands of Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Perard. The Islands of Magic by Elsie Spicer Eels. Chapter Seven Fresh Figs. The Story of a Clever Youth and a Foolish One. Long ago there lived a little maid who fell ill. Her father was very rich, and he did everything he could for her. One day, she said, If I only had some fresh figs, I'm sure I'd feel better. Now, it was in the month of January. It would be many long months before the fresh figs would be ripe. The rich man was greatly worried. Not even his fortune could ripen the figs, as he well knew. Nevertheless, he decided to advertise, and therefore said, Whoever shall bring fresh figs to my daughter shall marry her, if he be young. If he be old, he shall receive his reward in money. This announcement was spread abroad throughout the whole country, but no one had any fresh figs in the month of January. At last, however, there was a woman found who had a fig tree close by the side of her house protected from the cold winds by the house and by the high wall of her garden. This woman had a few fresh figs, but they were small and not very good. Send them to the little maid who is sick, advised her neighbors. Indeed, I'll send them as soon as my son can get ready to start, replied the good woman. Now, the woman had two sons. One of them was foolish but the other was considered one of the cleverest youths in the whole countryside. He left home immediately with the best of the figs in his basket. On the way he met a woman dressed in blue with a child in her arms. It was really the Holy Mother and her child, but he did not recognize them. "'What are you carrying in your basket?' asked the woman. "'I am carrying horns,' replied the clever youth. Yes, you are carrying horns, replied the woman. The young man went on to the rich man's house, supposing that he was carrying figs in his basket, just as when he started out. The basket had grown heavy. What have you got in your basket? asked the rich man when he saw the youth at his door. I have brought some fresh figs from my garden to your daughter, who is ill, replied the clever one. The rich man was delighted. He opened the basket. Then he shook the boy roughly by the collar and pushed him away down the steep steps. There were horns in the basket. "'What do you mean by playing such a trick on me?' called the rich man after him. "'Never let me see your face in these parts again.' There were still a few of the poorest of the fresh figs remaining on the tree. The foolish son begged his mother for permission to carry them to the little maid who was sick. Yes, go with them, replied his mother. Who knows but what you may wed the rich man's daughter. She laughed as she said it. The boy, who was foolish, started for the rich man's house with the figs in his basket. They were only a very few and poor little things indeed. On the way, he met a woman dressed in blue with a child in her arms. What are you carrying in your basket? asked the woman. Fresh figs for a little maid who is sick, replied the boy. Yes, you are carrying figs, said the woman. The boy opened his basket. Here, take one for the baby, he said. He's a lovely child. He gave one of the best figs to the baby and went on his way to the rich man's house. What have you in your basket? asked the rich man. Fresh figs from my garden for your daughter, who is sick, replied the boy. The rich man opened the basket with a scowl upon his face. He well remembered how he had been tricked before. Then his eyes grew wide with surprise. What? Figs like these in January? he cried in amazement. The figs had grown large and beautiful on the road to the rich man's house. They filled the whole basket. The little maid was so happy when she saw them that she began to grow better immediately. When her father saw that the youth was foolish, he repented of his promise to give his daughter in marriage to any young man who brought fresh figs to her. 
However, he had given his word, and it was not a thing to be lightly broken. "'I'll tell you what to do to get out of your difficulty,' said his friend, to whom he told his trouble. "'Turn two lively rabbits out on the mountain, and tell the boy that he'll lose his life if he doesn't catch them and bring them back at night.' That is exactly what the rich man did. The poor youth tried in vain to catch the rabbits. He got very tired and hot, and, foolish as he was, he knew enough to realize that the task set for him was quite impossible. Suddenly he saw the woman, dressed in blue, standing before him with the child in her arms. "'What is the matter?' she asked him. The boy told her how he would lose his life if he did not catch the rabbits and bring them back to the rich man at nightfall. The woman cut a reed and made a pipe of it. "'Play on this pipe,' she said, "'and the rabbits will come back to you of their own accord.' The youth played such sweet music on his pipe that the two rabbits came running up to him immediately. It was all he could do to keep away the other beasts and birds. Everything which heard the music was charmed by it. On his way back to the rich man's house, he met two men who had been sent to kill him. No one had dreamed, of course, that he'd really catch the rabbits. The two men were so surprised, when they saw them in the bag, that their eyes stuck out. The rich man was even more amazed. As for the little maid who had been sick, when she heard the sweet music which the youth played upon the pipe, she was quite ready to marry him. The wedding was celebrated with great joy. End of Chapter 7 Fresh Figs The Story of a Clever Youth and a Foolish One Chapter 8 of The Islands of Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. The Islands of Magic by Elsie Spicer Eels. Peter of the Pigs The Story of a Sharp Lad and a Sharper. Long ago there lived a man who employed a boy to take care of his pigs. The lad's name was Peter, and he was commonly called by everyone in the countryside Peter of the Pigs. One day a man came up to him and said, Sell me these seven pigs. I can't sell but six of them, said Peter. I must keep one, but you may buy the other six if you will cut off their tails and ears and leave them for me. The man promised to do this, and the boy pocketed the money. The six pigs looked sad enough without their tails and ears as they were driven away by their new master. Peter led his one remaining pig down to the sand pit. He buried it halfway in the sand. He buried the tails and ears of the other six pigs, too, so that part of them stuck out. Then he ran with all speed for his master. "'Come and help me get the pigs out of the sand-pit,' he called out. His master ran as fast as he could to the sand-pit. There he saw one of the pigs halfway out of the sand. He and Peter together soon pulled it out completely. Then he took hold of the tail nearby. To his horror it appeared to break off in his hand. "'Run to the house and ask my wife to give you two shovels.' cried the owner of the pigs. With the shovels we can dig out the rest of the pigs. The boy ran to the house. He knew that his master kept his money in two big bags. My master says that you shall give me his two money bags, said Peter to his mistress. The woman did not approve of doing this. Are you sure he said both of them? she asked. Yes, both of them said Peter. Go ask him yourself. Accordingly, the woman ran out of the house. Did you say both of them? She called to her husband. Yes, both of them, he replied. Be quick about it, too. 
of course the poor man thought that she was asking about the two shovels which he had sent peter to get thus peter received his master's two bags of money and set out into the world with the bags on his shoulder and his pockets full of the money he had obtained from the sale of the six pigs after a time peter of the pigs met a robber the robber stole one of his money bags and ran away with it peter ran after him now it happened that the robber had just killed a deer he was carrying the liver inside his blouse as he ran he threw it back so that he could run faster peter saw what he had done if you want to catch me you'll have to throw away your liver too called out the robber over his shoulder peter of the pigs pulled out his knife and cut out his liver of course he dropped dead at once when at last peter's master found out that he had been deceived he ran after the lad as he found him lying dead there by the wayside he said oh peter of the pigs you were sharp but you found someone who was sharper thus it is in life end of peter of the pigs recording by pamela krantz of the islands of magic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson the islands of magic by elsie spicer eels the princess who lost her rings the story the lame old women told long ago there lived a lovely princess who owned the most beautiful rings in the whole world she had rings set with diamonds and rings set with pearls she had rings set with rubies and rings set with sapphires she had rings set with emeralds and turquoises and amethysts and every other kind of precious stone she had rings which had no precious stones in them but which were wonderfully decorated with fine and delicate carving wrought with great skill the princess lived in a magnificent palace surrounded by a high wall her own apartments opened on a pleasant balcony from the balcony she could see the blue waters of the ocean and the tall trees of the forest here she liked to pass her days in a corner of the balcony there was a basin and pitcher of silver always kept filled with water in order that the princess might wash her hands on the balcony instead of having to go inside the house Whenever she washed her hands, she always removed the ring she was wearing that day. Some days it was one ring, and some days it was another, but whatever ring it happened to be, the princess always took it off carefully when she washed her hands. One day, a pretty white rabbit came up to the balcony to play with the princess. That day the princess was wearing her best diamond ring. She removed it very carefully when she washed her hands then it disappeared she knew that the rabbit must have stolen it the next day the rabbit came again and that day the princess lost her best emerald ring she was very sure that the rabbit must have stolen that too however she liked to play with the rabbit so she said nothing to her father the king about the lost rings every day the rabbit came and every day there was a ring missing the princess had a large box full of rings in the beginning but one morning she opened the box and saw that it was entirely empty she remembered then that she had put on her last ring one set with a sapphire the morning before the princess became so sad that she would not go out to the balcony to play with the white rabbit every day she grew sadder and sadder at last her father the king noticed it what is the matter with our daughter the princess he asked the queen she is sad now and once she was the very jolliest happiest princess in the whole world i cannot imagine what the trouble is replied the queen perhaps she is lonely let us send for the storytellers of the kingdom to come and tell her their stories to entertain her accordingly the king sent for all the storytellers in the whole kingdom all the storytellers had to come to the palace 
even if they were old and lame. Now it so happened that in the kingdom there were two old women who were very lame. They knew the most interesting stories of anybody, but it took them so long to reach the palace that they forgot all their best stories on the way. What story are you going to tell the princess? One of the lame old women asked the other. I can't remember a single one of my stories, said the other old woman. It has taken my lame old legs so long to travel the road to the palace that now that we are almost there, I can't think of a single story. The two old women tried to remember some of their stories, but they could not think of any. They were almost at the royal palace, too. What shall we do if we can't remember our stories? asked the first old woman. We'll have to learn some new stories replied the other. Just then they spied a queer sight. There was a little donkey without any feet, travelling along the road. On his back was a load of wood. What a queer donkey, cried the first old woman. Let us follow along after him. Perhaps we shall be able to tell a story about him, replied the other. The two old women followed the donkey into the forest. There was a little thatched roofed house in the forest, and before the house there was a fire burning. A kettle of something which smelled good was boiling merrily over the fire. The donkey, which had no feet, stopped beside the fire and left his load of wood. The two old women stopped beside the fire too. What do you suppose is cooking in this kettle? asked one of the old women. It smells so good, I'm going to taste and see, said the other. She started to taste, but as she was about to stick in her finger, she heard a strange, deep voice which seemed to come out of the little thatched house. Do not touch, it is not yours, is what the voice said. The two old women went up to the door of the house, and one of them peeped through the keyhole. Inside the house, she saw a pretty white rabbit playing with a box full of rings. Suddenly, the white rabbit pulled off his skin and changed into a handsome prince. "'What wouldn't I give to see the owner of these rings?' cried the prince. The two lame old women hurried away from the little house in the forest. They were frightened of the queer doings there. "'I know a story to tell the princess,' cried one of the old women when she had recovered from her fright. "'I'll tell her how I peeped through the keyhole and saw the rabbit change his skin.' "'I know what I'll tell the princess,' said the other old woman. "'I'll tell her how I followed the donkey without any feet,' and what the strange voice said to me when I tried to taste the good-smelling broth in the kettle. "'We must keep saying our stories so we don't forget them,' said the first old woman. "'We must hurry on our way to the royal palace and get there while we remember them,' said the other. The two old women hurried on their way to the palace as fast as their lame old legs could carry them. They rehearsed their stories over and over along the way so they would not forget them. Many storytellers had told their tales to the princess. They were jolly tales, too, but the princess was not in the least cheered by them. She remembered her lost rings even when she was listening to the stories. If the storytellers cannot make the princess happy, who can? asked the king in despair. I'm sure I don't know, replied the queen. She always used to like stories. Finally, the two old women reached the royal palace and went to tell their tales to the princess. The first old woman told the story of the donkey without any feet and the broth in the kettle. The princess did not appear to be particularly interested, even when the old woman told about the strange deep voice which said, Do not touch, it is not yours. Cold chills, however, ran up and down the spines of the king and queen and all the courtiers when she came to that part of the tale. Next, the other old woman told how she peeped through the keyhole of the little thatched house in the forest and saw the white rabbit change his skin. The pretty dark eyes of the princess sparkled when the old woman mentioned the rabbit, and she leaned forward in her chair eagerly. Our dear little princess looks like her own happy self again for the first time in ages, whispered the king to the queen. When the old woman told of the rabbit's words, what would I not give to see the owner of these rings? The princess clapped her hands. Take me to see this rabbit at once, she cried. The king and queen and all the courtiers went with the princess to find the white rabbit. 
the two old women went first to point out the way and as these old women were so lame the whole procession moved very slowly at last they drew near the forest there was a donkey without any feet moving along the road with a load of wood on his back the two old women the princess the king and queen and all the courtiers followed the donkey into the deep forest to the door of the little thatched house before the house the fire was burning and something which smelled good was boiling in the kettle the princess stuck in her finger to try it take it it's yours said the strange deep voice from the little house the princess was so surprised that she forgot to taste the good smelling broth she ran to the door of the house and peeped through the keyhole there was the white rabbit playing with a box full of rings set with diamonds and pearls rings set with rubies and sapphires rings set with emeralds and amethysts and turquoises and rings set with no precious stones at all but carved delicately with great skill what wouldn't i give to see the owner of these rings said the rabbit as he pulled off his skin and changed into a handsome prince here's the owner of the rings cried the princess she is here at your very door the door of the little thatched house in the deep forest swiftly opened and the prince received the princess in his arms your words have broken my enchantment he cried now that at last the voice of the owner of these rings is heard at my door i'll never have to put on my rabbit skin again end of chapter nine Chapter ten of the Islands of Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Islands of Magic by Elsie Spicer Eels. Chapter ten. The Master of Magic. The story of a boy who learned his lessons in school once upon a time there lived a man who had three sons the older ones worked in the fields but the youngest one went to school he learned how to read and write and do sums and make drawings at last he even learned magic the two elder brothers complained to their father about him one day their hearts were bitter against him it's not fair father they said we work hard every day in the fields and bring home money to enrich the family why shouldn't our brother work too he does nothing except study the youngest son heard their words of complaint will you go hunting with me tomorrow father he asked i have learned with magic in fact i have become a master of magic i will turn myself into a hunting dog if you will go into the fields with me the next day the young man changed himself by magic into a hunting dog and his father went into the fields with him he bagged many rabbits that day as they returned home he met one of his friends what luck today asked his friend the hunter proudly displayed the rabbits he had in his bag i have them thanks to my dog he said i'd like to buy that dog of yours said his friend what will you take for him the father named an enormous price and to his great surprise his friend accepted it the money was passed over at once and the hunting dog went home with his new master the next day they went on a hunting expedition into the deep forest suddenly the dog disappeared his master called and whistled to him in vain finally he was obliged to return home without him he had lost both the dog and the money he had paid for him have you seen my hunting dog were his words for many weeks to everyone he met his hunting dog had fled into a deep forest and once more resumed his original form he returned home and told his two brothers that in a single day he had earned for his father more than their combined efforts for many weeks indeed it was quite true the next day the young man said to his father Will you buy a saddle and bridle for me if I turn myself into a horse? His father made the purchase, and then the young man changed into a handsome black horse. His father rode him up and down the streets very proudly. 
the great magician noticed the beautiful beast he called the man to him and said that is a very good horse you are riding what will you sell him for the father named an enormous price but he at once paid it cheerfully he ordered the horse placed in his stables now the great magician had a beautiful daughter who was very fond of horses she went out to inspect his new purchase as soon as it was brought home she noticed that the horse ate nothing what a beauty she cried as she stroked his glossy black coat you are the handsomest horse in the stable why don't you eat i believe your bridle is hurting you i'm going to take it off as soon as the bridle was removed it was changed into a bird and flew out the window the great magician at that moment changed himself into a hawk and killed the bird never dreaming that it was the bridle of the new horse he had purchased the next morning when the great magician went to mount his beautiful black steed there was no new horse to be found in the stable the horse had changed into a kernel of corn the great magician transformed himself into a hen and ate up the corn but the youth was too quick for him he changed into a dog and seized the hen between his teeth and gave it a good shaking then he returned to his own form and explained the whole affair to the great magician you are surely a master of magic was the comment of the magician when the great magician had forgiven him for the shaking he had received when he was in the form of a hen he gladly gave his consent to his daughter's marriage to the master of magic end of chapter 10、11、of the islands of magic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by Libby Gone. The Islands of Magic by Elsie Spencer Eels. St. Anthony's Godchild. The Story of Antonia, Who Became a King's Page. Long ago there lived a man who had so many children that he could scarcely find godfathers for them all. He had requested so many of his friends to serve that when his last baby was born, a little dark eyed daughter, he vowed that he'd ask the first man he met upon the street. As luck would have it, he happened to meet the good St. Anthony. Will you be godfather to my baby daughter? he asked. Kind St. Anthony gladly consented. He named the baby Antonia and said to the father, Train up this child in the way she should go. Teach her all you can. When she is thirteen years old, I'll come to get her, and I'll give her a good start in life. The years flew by, and soon little Antonia was thirteen years old. The father was afraid that St. Anthony had forgotten his promise, but one day the saint appeared. Is this my godchild? he asked as he looked at Antonia. Surely she has grown prettier each year of her life. Antonia blushed shyly and looked even more attractive than before. Dress yourself in your brother's garments, he said to her. I am going to take you to the king's court, and you are entirely too pretty to go there in your own dresses. Accordingly, Antonia put on her brother's clothes and went to serve as a page to the king. She was now called Anthony instead of Antonia. Now, the king had a sister who grew very fond of the little page. She became angry that the page did not love her in return and plotted against him. One day she went to the king and said, Your little page says that he can separate all the chaff from the wheat in a single night. Let him try, responded the king. When Anthony heard what the king required, he was decidedly worried. Then he remembered that he was the godchild of St. Anthony, and that the saint was always ready to aid those in need. He called upon St. Anthony to help him fulfill the king's command. In the morning, the king's wheat was entirely free from chaff. The king loved his little page more and more, and the king's sister was angrier than before that she could not win the affection of the youth. She made a new plot against him. What do you suppose that page is saying now? she asked her brother. He boasts that he can go to the palace of the king of the Moors and steal the purse of gold pieces from beneath his pillow. The king sent Anthony to the palace of the king of the Moors. With St. Anthony's help, he climbed up the high wall of the palace and crept in through a window. 
the king of the moors was so sound asleep that anthony had no difficulty whatever in slipping his hand under the pillow and stealing the purse then he crept out again without awakening the king that young page anthony has grown so very boastful remarked the king's sister a few days after his return that he now claims he can carry away the king of the moors himself then she added i'll marry him if he fulfills this boast bring home the king of the moors as your captive were the king's orders to anthony the page was very much worried for he thought that it would be more difficult to capture the king of the moors than it had been to capture his purse not at all dear godchild said the kind saint anthony when he had heard about the king's new command anthony climbed up the wall as before and crept in through the window then he rolled the king of the moors up in the bedclothes and tossed him out of the window by the time the king was really awakened from his sleep he was in the boat ready to sail away when anthony returned to the palace with his captive the king said my best and bravest page you are worthy indeed of any honour you shall wed my sister i can't marry her said anthony my name is antonia in that case said the king i'll marry you myself end of saint anthony's godchild Twelve of the Islands of Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Janovitz. The Islands of Magic by Elsie Spicer Ells. Trouble when one's young. The story of a maid's choice. Long ago. There lived a beautiful maiden whose name was Clarina. She had been betrothed to a prince whom she had never seen. When at last he should be old enough to receive the rule of the kingdom, he was coming to claim her as his bride. Clarina had lived in a magnificent palace surrounded by a beautiful garden. Every day she spent hours among the lovely flowers and trees. One day, an eagle alighted on the tallest tree in the garden. "'Good morning, fair Clarina,' he said to her. "'Good morning,' she replied in surprise. Never before had an eagle spoken to her. "'Which do you prefer, trouble when you are young or when you are old?' asked the eagle. Clarina did not know what to say. That night she asked her mother which she would be better to choose. "'Choose trouble when you're young, dear child,' advised her mother. "'When you are young, it is easy to bear anything. "'But when you are old, you can endure nothing.' "'She remembered her mother's words. "'Next day, when the eagle again addressed the same question to her, "'she answered, "'Trouble when I'm young.' "'Clarina had hardly said these words "'when the eagle lifted her up by the pink skirt she was wearing "'and carried her away. "'On he flew over seas and mountains. "'Clarina was frightened nearly to death. "'At last the eagle set her down in a strange land. "'She was hungry and accordingly hired out to a bake shop "'to earn her living. "'She would have been happier if the eagle had flown away, but he remained in a nearby treetop. The baker went out, leaving Clarina to bake the dough, which he had left ready to put into the oven. The little maid carefully closed the door and all the windows so that the eagle would not be able to get inside. As soon as the baker was out of sight, however, he flew down the chimney. He tore about the bake shop, spilling all the dough on the floor and breaking the dishes. Then... He went back up the chimney when he had completed all the damage there was to be done. When the baker returned, he flew into a terrible rage. He gave poor Clarina a beating and turned her out into the street. She walked about the city and at last found work as shopkeeper in a little shop on a corner. The owner of the business went away next day, leaving her in charge of everything. As soon as he was gone, she shut the door and all the windows, but the eagle flew down the chimney and broke the cups and glasses and plates which were set out for sale in neat rows upon the shelf. 
"'What have you been doing in my shop?' cried the owner in anger, when he returned and saw the destruction which the eagle had left behind. He didn't give the poor girl a chance to reply, but seized her roughly and threw her out into the street. Clarina walked and walked, seeking work, and at last she arrived at the door of the royal palace. "'Do you happen to need a servant?' she asked the queen." I have all the servants I need, replied the queen. The prince was standing nearby. Hire her mother, he advised. She'll do to take care of the ducks. Accordingly, the queen hired Clarina to care for the ducks. The next morning, all the ducks in the royal duck yard were dead. The eagle had killed them all. Hire her for a seamstress, mother, said the prince. The poor little thing is crying as if her heart would break. I'm sorry for her. The queen hired Clarina to be a seamstress in the royal palace. That very day the prince left home to visit his betrothed. He was going to marry a beautiful maiden in a neighboring land whom he had never seen. As he left the palace, he asked each one of the servants what gifts he should bring at his return. When he came to Clarina, her reply was, "'Bring me a stone from the palace wall of your betrothed.' "'The prince thought it was a strange request, but he promised to fulfill it. "'As soon as the prince arrived in the land where his betrothed lived, "'he found out that the palace was in mourning "'because of her mysterious disappearance one day from the garden. "'He was so sad that he could not linger in that land. "'He stayed only long enough to buy the gifts "'which he had promised to bring to the servants.' along with the other gifts he carried, a stone from the palace garden of his betrothed. When Clarina received her gift, she heard the story of the mysterious disappearance of the prince's bride. As soon as she held the stone in her hand, she knew that it came from the wall of her own loved garden. Joy shone in her beautiful eyes. For the first time, the prince noticed how very lovely Clarina was. He had always liked the little maid, even when her face was sad, but now that she was happy, he saw that she was the most beautiful girl he had ever seen. "'What does that pretty little maid intend to do with that stone?' he asked the queen. "'I cannot guess,' replied the queen. "'She seemed happy enough to receive it. I never saw her look happy before. Trouble seems to follow whatever she undertakes. I was on the point of discharging her.' She caused me nothing but endless annoyance. I hired her only to please you. The prince followed Clarina and listened at her door. Inside her room she was talking to the stone. Oh, stone from my garden wall, she was saying. How are the flowers of my garden? The prince could hardly believe his ears. Suddenly he guessed what the truth might be. He burst into the room. "'Are you my betrothed, who has disappeared from her own land?' he asked Clarina. She smiled into his eyes. "'Trouble when one's young is hard enough to bear,' she said when she had told all her story. "'I've had quite enough to last me all my life. "'Your woes are ended now, and a happy life lies before you,' said the prince. "'Our wedding shall be celebrated at once.'" End of Trouble When One's Young Chapter 13 of The Islands of Magic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Rutters The Islands of Magic by Elsie Spicer Eels the Little Maid Who Was Wise The Story of a Robber Who Was Outwitted Long ago there lived a merchant who had three daughters. Every year, at a certain day of a certain month, he went away to a distant city to collect money on an account. His wife and daughters remained at home, and all went well until one sad day the wife died. That year the merchant looked forward to his journey with dread, for he would have to leave his daughters alone. I cannot bear to go away, he said to them. My heart is filled with fear, lest some evil may befall you during my absence. He worried about the matter night and day. The business was important, and there was no one whom he could send to transact it for him. 
however the question of leaving three such pretty girls unprotected was a thing not to be regarded lately do not be afraid to leave us dear father said his daughters nothing will harm us while you are away how do you know asked their father i am older and wiser than you are and i know that there are many evils which might come upon you there are many bold thieves in the city for instance who would be only too ready to take advantage of my absence and rob my home of all i possess we can lock ourselves securely in the house and not let any one enter said the three daughters be sure that you admit no one commanded the merchant they gave him their promise and he started on his journey nevertheless he went with an anxious heart now outside this city there was a band of bold robbers the captain of the band had watched the merchant's departure and when he was safely away the thief dressed himself in the disguise of an old beggar when it was evening he led his band into a nearby street and in his disguise approached the merchant's house he knocked at the door have pity upon a poor unfortunate one he called out it is raining outside and no one with mercy in his heart could turn away one who begs shelter from the storm let me enter i pray you to pass the night under your roof it's surely a terrible storm outside said the merchant's eldest daughter as the wind rattled the tiles of the roof and the rain beat in torrents against the doors and windows i think we ought to take pity on a poor beggar on a night like this the second daughter peeped out of the window at the beggar he is old as well as poor she said our father has always taught us to show mercy and kindness to the aged remember our promise to our father cried the youngest one we gave him our word that we would admit no one we can give this poor beggar some alms and send him away with a blessing the eldest daughter frowned it is not for the youngest and most childish one of us to make the plans she said the second daughter added we too are older and wiser than you are it is for us to determine what shall be done if we decide to show mercy to this poor beggar it is not for you to oppose it but we should not forget our promise to our father cried the youngest daughter however in spite of all she could say the elder sisters opened the door and admitted the beggar they led him into the kitchen to dry his clothes then they made ready a bed for him to sleep upon they gave him his supper in the kitchen and then they ate their own it is a fearful night to send away a beggar said the eldest sister while they were eating i am glad we made him comfortable for the night remarked the middle sister i am thinking that our dear father would be anxious if he knew that we had broken our promise so easily said the youngest sister for shame cried the eldest i don't think it was breaking our promise to show kindness to an old poor beggar said the middle one a promise is a promise nevertheless said the youngest while they were talking the beggar had taken the apples which the girls were to eat for dessert and had sprinkled a sleeping powder over them the two eldest ate their apples but the youngest could not eat that night she threw the apple away as soon as they had eaten the girls went to their room and the two eldest were overcome with sleep almost before they had time to get into bed the youngest one was so frightened that she could not sleep a single wink soon she heard footsteps the beggar entered the room the youngest one pretended that she too was asleep the man went to the bed of the eldest sister and stuck a pin into her foot to see if she were completely unconscious she did not stir and he knew that the sleeping powder had thoroughly done its work then he went to the bed of the second sister and did the same she was as completely unconscious as her sister it hurt terribly when he stuck the pin into the foot of the youngest but she did not stir the robber thought that she was as completely overcome by the sleeping powder as the others the youngest sister peeped through her long heavy eyelashes and watched the beggar she saw to her surprise that he had laid aside the heavy ragged old coat which he had kept wrapped about him even while he ate underneath he was dressed like a robber with a sword pistols and dagger she was so terribly frightened that it was all she could do to keep her teeth from chattering she heard the robber go out about the house picking out the valuables which he wanted to steal 
Then she heard him go down the stairway and unbolt the heavy doors which led into the store. She quietly got up and crept out of her room to hear him more distinctly. On a chair in the living room she saw the sword which he had taken off. He had evidently thought that, with all three girls so sound asleep, he'd not need to use his weapons. Soon she heard the heavy outer doors of the store unbolt. The robber had gone outside to call the rest of the band. The little girl flew down the stairs and closed the doors of the store securely. They were big and heavy, but her great fear gave her strength. He'll find it difficult to get into our house again, she said to herself, as she waited to see if the robber returned. Soon she heard footsteps outside. She knew that the thief had brought back others with him. There were frightful words when they found that the door was shut. It was the youngest one who deceived me, cried the robber chieftain. I knew all the time that she did not want to let me in. I was suspicious of her from the first. Perhaps we can outwit her yet, cried another. She may not be so wise as she appears. You can never tell. The leader of the band of thieves went up close to the keyhole and whispered, Kind lady of the house, have pity on me. The merchant's daughter at first did not answer, but as he kept on calling to her, she finally asked him what it was that he wanted. I have left my charm behind, he cried. Pray let me enter to get it. I promise you I will do you no harm. I do not trust your promises, replied the little maid. You shall not come into my father's house. Pass the charm out to me, then, said the robber. It's in the fire, replied the girl. Go throw vinegar on the fire and put it out, said the captain of the thieves. Then you can pull my charm out in safety. Now, it happened that there was a little hole in the door, just large enough for a man's hand to enter. It was the hole through which beggars often thrust outstretched hands, asking for alms. Put your hand through the hole in the door, replied the little maid. Then I'll give you your charm. She quickly ran upstairs and got the robber's sword, which he had left on a chair in the dining room. When she returned, his hand was sticking through the hole in the door. She struck it with all her might with the great sword and cut it off. The cries and curses of the robbers filled the air. They tried in vain to break down the great doors. The doors were strung and held securely. At last it was daylight and the band of thieves had to flee. In the morning the effect of the sleeping powder wore off and the two elder sisters awoke. When they heard their sister's story they were filled with amazement. I don't believe a word of it, cried the oldest. You're making it up. You have a bad dream, said the second. I had such a nightmare myself that I have a headache this morning. It was not until their little sister had shown them the robber's hand and the great sword that they were convinced that she had told them the truth. Oh, why did we ever let that man into our house, cried the eldest. Oh, why didn't we keep our promise to our father, cried the middle one. When at last the merchant returned from the distant city where he had been to collect money, he was delighted to find his house and his three daughters safe. I see that no harm befell you in my absence, he said as he embraced them fondly. All my worries about you were foolish. The eldest daughter blushed and hung her head. Great danger threatened us while you were away, she said. Thanks to our youngest sister, we are safe. Our little sister was wiser than we were, said the middle daughter. When the merchant had heard the whole story, he said, After this, we must all give ear to the wisdom of this little maid. She is wise beyond her years. End of The Little Maid Who Was Wise Fourteen of The Islands of Magic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Islands of Magic by Elsie Spicer Eels Chapter 14 Manuel Littlebean The Story of How He Helped His Father Long ago there lived a man and his wife who had no children, I wish I had a little boy, said the man. I'd like a son of my own, even if he were not any larger than a little bean, said the woman. 
Time passed, and a son was born to this worthy couple. He was no larger than a little bean, and as the years went by he never grew any bigger. His name was Manuel Little Bean. He caused his mother endless trouble by constantly getting lost. Sometimes she'd nearly step on him. Other times he'd fall into the food and she would almost swallow him. One day his mother couldn't find him. Manuel Little Bean! Manuel Little Bean! She called. There was no answer. She went outside the house and called his name anxiously. There was no reply. She asked all the neighbors if they had seen the child, but there was nobody who had noticed him that day. His poor mother was nearly wild with anxiety. I'm afraid I'll never see the dear child again, she mourned. I'm sure I have either stepped on him or swallowed him. You never stepped on him or swallowed him yet, comforted her husband. However, he added anxiously, I can't see what has become of my Manuel. The truth of the matter was that Manuel Littlebean had been swallowed by the goat. He was a most active youngster, in spite of his small size, and he caused the goat a terrible attack of indigestion. The goat did not know what was the matter, and he tore around so wildly and caused so much destruction that his master decided to kill him. I simply can't be bothered with that goat any longer, he said. I have quite enough to worry about already, with Manuel Little being lost and my poor wife nearly sick with anxiety because of it. He never dreamed that it was his son who was making the goat so wild with misery. When the goat was dead, he threw it out into the street. That night, a wolf came and ate the goat. He swallowed the goat's stomach so greedily that Manuel Littlebean had no time to escape. However, he jumped about just as actively inside the wolf as he had done when the goat had swallowed him. The wolf was just as uncomfortable as the goat had been. What is the matter with me? thought the wolf. Never in my life have I had such a stomach ache. I believe I'm going to die. He ran away into the forest and crept into a cave to await his end. Inside the cave was a robber's den. Three of the robbers were there, counting over the gold they had just brought back. When they saw the wolf, they were so frightened that they dropped their bags of gold and ran away as fast as they could, leaving everything behind them. Manuel Littlebean guessed that he was making the wolf sick. If I can only make him so ill that he will spit me up, said Manuel to himself as he jumped about his liveliest. That is exactly what happened. The wolf spit Manuel Littlebean out. He was decidedly dirty and unattractive, but he didn't mind in the least. He saw the quantities of gold in the robber's cave and his eyes shone. If I can only find my way home to tell my father about it, he will be a rich man, he cried. It was a long distance home, and several times he thought that he had lost his way. Finally, however, he saw his own mother's light in the window. He ran toward it as fast as he could run. Manuel Littlebean, what have you been doing? cried his mother when she saw him. Where did you get so dirty? Come, let me give you a bath the first thing. Never mind about the bath, mother, said Manuel. I have more important things to attend to. Where is father? His mother called her husband, and they both forgot how dirty the child was when they heard his story. Let us hurry to the robber's cave, father, he said. We must get there before they return. But what about the wolf? asked his mother anxiously. Manuel Littlebean laughed. The wolf doesn't have a stomach ache now, he said. He went home long ago. They went to the robber's cave and brought home the huge sacks full of gold. It was enough to make them live like princes for a lifetime. I have the best and cleverest son in the world, said the father. Never in the world was there a son who was such a joy and comfort to his parents, said his mother. 
Manuel Littlebean was treated by everyone as politely as if he had been big. End of chapter 14